The other advantage is in a typical gas-fired furnace, you're using a minimum of a four-inch duct. And again, when you're looking at some of those ducts have to run through cabinetry, under beds, crawl spaces, they're taking up space. With the twin tip, you're circulating antifreeze and half-inch pipes. Welcome to the Tiny House Lifestyle Podcast, the show where you learn how to plan, build, and live the tiny lifestyle. I'm your host, Ethan Waldman, and this is episode 280 with Jerry Walter. Jerry Walter is an inventor and entrepreneur who has revolutionized tankless hot water systems for small and tiny houses. His company, Precision Temp, offers innovative and American-made water heating solutions for both heat and hot water. From onboard hot water for sailors to portable heaters for firefighters and tiny house tankless heaters, Jerry has done it all. Today, he's here to share his expertise on compact, cutting-edge hot water heating solutions for the tiny house movement. We'll talk through the different models that Precision Temp offers and discuss why you might choose one over the other. Plus, we discuss hydronic heat and why it's an option more people should consider. If you're planning to build a tiny home, you won't want to miss this episode. So let's dive in and learn from Jerry Walter. I asked John and Finn Kernahan of United Tiny House Association what they love about their precision temp hot water heaters, and here's what they told me. Hey, Ethan, uh, this is uh, John and Finn Kernahan with United Tiny House Association. We organize tiny house festivals. Oh, yeah, I guess so. First and foremost. We have a total of three precision temp on-demand hot water heaters. The thing we really like about these, and folks know this, I think they picked this up on Finn and I, if we don't like something... You'll never hear us talk about it. So the two things that we noticed and experienced immediately, uh, they took painstaking effort to make sure that it was done right and installed. And so that was pretty cool right there. The other thing is the continuous on-demand hot water that just ran forever without any fluctuations or anything. I, I can't imagine an application, especially in our environment and our lifestyle of being the, the, the nomad, transportable, mobile, tiny lifestyle where um, one of these units aren't good to use. Right now, Precision Temp is offering $100 off any unit plus free shipping when you use the coupon code THLP. So head over to precisiontemp.com and use the coupon code THLP at checkout for $100 off any unit. That's P-R-E-C-I-S-I-O-N temp.com, coupon code T-H-L-P. Thank you so much to Precision Temp for sponsoring our show. All right, I am here with Jerry Walter. Jerry is a visionary whose unexpected journey led him from photojournalism at the Cincinnati Inquirer to pioneering tankless hot water systems. From rehabbing his own house to mastering plumbing and wiring, Jerry's curiosity was piqued by an old tankless heater driving him to modernize the concept. A sailor at heart, he revolutionized onboard hot water, later expanding Precision Temp's innovations to include portable heaters for firefighters, gas dishwasher boosters, and game-changing RV tankless heaters. With an eye on efficiency, Jerry's latest frontier is the tiny house movement, offering compact, cutting-edge heating solutions. Precision Temp not only stands out for innovation, but also for its unmatched American-made quality and customer service. Jerry Walter, welcome to the show. Hello, Ethan. Thank you for having me communicate with your all your friends on, on tiny homes. It's, that introduction gave me a big head. <laughs> Thank you. Well, well good. Uh, you know, it's it's... You know, we've been working with Precision Temp here at at Tiny House Lifestyle Podcast for for years now. I have a Precision Temp unit in my tiny house, and I, I feel like Precision Temp it really is like the go to hot water heater if you want to have a tiny house that's like really comfortable and you know unlimited hot water. Who who can argue with that? Yeah, I hope uh, hope I can answer all the questions you have today uh, to communicate to the community. Uh, so they can share the experiences we have. Because I've been eating in my house uh, with precision temp, house and hot water for the last twenty years, and uh, wow, see some of you, some of the community people do that. Yeah, well, you know, maybe we should start with just an explanation of you know why a tankless hot water heater 
is more efficient than, you know, a tank based hot water heater. And maybe you could talk a little bit about kind of the genesis of things, you know, because I, I'm I'm assuming that RVs in, you know, in the old days probably had tank based hot water heaters and some of them probably still do. Yes, I think the majority of RVs today still have tank-based hot water. Okay. And uh, basically, it's because it's the way it's always been done. Mm-hmm. Tankless water heaters go all the way back to pre-World War II. They were actually invented by Bosch back in the 1930s. And they were used in the United States until about World War II. And uh, okay, they were very large, cumbersome, inefficient. Mm-hmm. but they still did a better job than tank heaters. They didn't use as much energy. You weren't paying to uh, store heat and reheat it. Mm -hmm. And it was only providing hot water on demand when you open the tap. When World War II came, copper became scarce because of the war effort. Ah. And copper was a big component of the tankless water heaters. So that's when America went over to tank heaters. They were cheaper. Not as efficient, but energy was cheap then. Space was not a consideration. So until the last several years, uh, tankless heaters uh, did not catch on into in American homes. And as you described, uh, when I built my original house, I heard about tankless water heaters, and I got my hands on an old rud from the 1930s mm-hmm. from Somebody I worked with in the newspaper business put it in, and that gave me the concept. Uh, he had a, a big sunken tub to fill, and uh, it was driven home by the when uh, my wife and I would go sailing and find out the only way we could take showers is run the engine on a sailboat or plug into short mm-hmm. power to get mm-hmm. six gallons of hot water. So that's how we came about designing the original heater. At that time, the technology on the European heaters uh, that were coming out of Europe was all mechanical. Temperature control okay. was bad. And we designed the first electronically controlled pilotless water heater in the world, actually. So it evolved from our original marine unit for sailboats, because that was our first love, into a couple commercial units. And because of the compact nature of it, and the portability of it, we made a small compact unit that could be used by fire departments for uh, mm-hmm. throwing up fire hydrants and the military for decontamination showers in the field. Wow. Then we got into the RV industry because we found just like tiny homes, and sometimes more so, space and weight and efficiency are a consideration. So the unit that we designed originally for the RV manufacturer and eventually evolved to be suited to the tiny home industry was less than half the size of a six-gallon tank mm-hmm. and provided continuous hot water, right? No matter how long you ran it. So yeah, and used about half of the amount of gas uh, that could yeah. be run either on propane or natural gas. I want to follow up. Briefly on on just the idea of a pilotless heater, just so that people understand kind of what that means. Um, so could you explain, you know, what, you know, what a heater with a pilot versus what a heater with a without a pilot, you know, what does that mean in terms of your gas consumption and, and just the use of it? A, a couple different things. Gas consumption of a pilot uh, by a pilot isn't that extreme. Mm-hmm. When it is a portable application, when you've got propane bottles and so on, it is a consideration. Mm-hmm. But the bigger considerations are pilots, pilot lights go out. Mm. They'll blow out, especially in a mobile application or any place where the flu is exposed to a wind. Mm-hmm. The other major consideration is safety. You don't have a standing flame that's unattended. And if that pilot goes out, it's about 30 seconds that the main gas burner could come on with no ignition and cause a very dangerous situation mm. of raw gas. Yeah. It will, with a high voltage spark, ignite the burner within a fraction of a second of it coming on. And it also proofs the flame, which means that if the burner doesn't come on within five to six seconds, it shuts the gas off. Mm-hmm. 
very much a, a safety factor to have electronic ignition and flame proofing over a pilot light. Got it. Got it. Yeah. And I actually, um, I, I can't remember the stat, but you know, it doesn't seem like a lot of gas, but over the days, weeks, months, years, you know, your pilot light actually does burn. It, it adds up. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, it's not only the inconvenience of filling tanks, mm -hmm. but it's an environmental thing. We all know that mm -hmm. uh, there's an energy crisis, a climate change crisis, and so on. Every little bit contributes to that. Yeah. That helps out. And then that combined with our temperature control, it only allows the burner to come up to a level needed to maintain the set temperature. So it's not always on full flame. So ah. you're saving you're saving more gas that way, plus having a more comfortable shower or whatever. So you've got a very consistent outlet temperature. Very nice. Yeah. And I, I, I concur about that consistent temperature that you get from from the, the unit. Yeah. Now on I did mention something to you about the unit that is very, very specific to mm -hmm. the tiny home industry, and it's our RV550 NSP. Mm -hmm. And the NSP stands for No Sidewall Penetration. Mm -hmm. Typical RV water heater, whether it be a tank, like the old-fashioned old ones, or our tankless, yeah. has, you have to cut a hole through the side of the RV mm -hmm. and the door that brings in the combustion air and allows the flue gases to go out is on the outside of the RV or tiny home. The NSP eliminates the need to cut that hole in there because you got a nice clean sidewall on your tiny home. You don't want all kinds of doors and access panels to yep. break up the appearance. So the NSP can be mounted like a one foot cube mounted in a cabinet, in a kitchen cabinet or whatever. Flew it out through an exhaust pipe through the floor, just like a two-inch exhaust. There's no visual impact. It's inside and takes up very little room, one cubic foot, which is very important. Yep. And when you've got limited space. Yeah, absolutely. The other features with that our unit has that no other unit has is we are able to be used in any climate any part of the country. It's not like limited to Southern use. Mm -hmm. We've got freeze protection, electronic freeze protection, again, that will mm -hmm. allow the user to use their water heater without draining it down to 20 below zero, wow. which in some areas in the northern part of the country is a big deal. And uh, in fact, we uh, sell a number of units up around the Arctic Circle wow. for thawing out uh, diesel equipment and so on. Uh huh. So fantastic. Yeah. And the nice thing is, a lot of the tiny homes are uh -huh. permanently placed. So we offer the option of either propane or natural gas when they do have natural gas available. Right. Now, one question that I often get from students and, and listeners about hot water heaters in general is, um, you know, maybe somebody is is building their tiny house and they're not planning to use any propane or natural gas and they still seem to want an on demand hot water heater for all the obvious benefits that they offer but i i often advise i i i have people steer clear of electric on demand hot water heaters and i was curious if you could explain kind of why electric why why is gas why does gas work so well for heating hot water versus electric? Well, basically, to put it in perspective, our heater is 55,000 BTUs, which is just about perfectly sized mm -hmm. for an application of a tiny home or RV. Okay. It's not oversized. It's sized so that even in the coldest water above freezing, yep. you can still get a comfortable shower. Yep. To get the same amount of heat with electric, it would take about over 100 amps of power. Wow. And that's a lot of power. It doesn't leave much for anything else. So basically the under-the-counter electric tankless heaters are nice for washing your hands. You know, it mm -hmm. may be you know, a quart a minute at, at reasonable temperatures. Beyond that, yep. electric just is not efficient, and it requires too much power, Yeah, heavier wires, and so on. Yeah. 
and it's it would be a much larger unit. Yeah. Theoretically, electric is very efficient because it's a dead short. All that heat goes into the hot water. Yeah. And being practical, it, it doesn't work nearly as well as gas. Yeah. Yeah. I always I always tell people when they're looking at any tankless water heater to look at, you know, the maximum temperature, the maximum rise they can get um, in, in degrees. And, you know, when you look at the electric units, you see maybe, you know, only like 20 degrees or 30 degrees. And so, you know, if you're getting cold city water at 50 degrees through your pipe, you know, you might only be able to get the water up to, you know, 80 degrees, which is not, yeah. not going to be a comfortable shower for you. No, the, the actual ideal shower temperature for a human being is about 105 degrees. Oh, okay. And uh, our unit, we cite, you, know, you want to make sure that, you know, some people put the large domestic wall mounted units in, which do mm -hmm. a great job for a large home. But in a tiny home application or an RV application, they're oversized. So mm -hmm. they won't be able to modulate down low enough for the lower flows and they'll cycle on and off. Yep. Ours is perfectly sized, roughly an 88 to 90 degree temperature rise per gallon per minute. Nice which is just about the right range for the application we're looking at. So in a lot of cases, bigger is better, but with hot water, you don't want to over capacity it because you will have cycling on and off and yep. have hot, cold spurts. And really undersizing it, you're going to get cold showers. Yeah. So right. Right. that's why you've got to hit, hit the sweet spot. Now, I know that, you know, there's the RV 550 and the 550 NSP. And the difference there is that the, the RV 550 can kind of replace an existing through wall hot water heater. And the, the NSP kind of mounts over a small hole in the floor and the exhaust pipe kind of flows out from there. Um, you have a couple of different models. Um, what so... Can you just talk a little bit about, you know, the shower mate and, and kind of who and what that is for? Sure. Actually, your description of the difference between the 550 and the 550 NSP is perfect. 550 okay. replaces a, a typical tank water heater on an RV. The uh, shower mate or the M550, you know, uh, called M550 mm -hmm. for Marine. Yeah. Uh, since we started it. In the sailboat industry, that's kind of a, a close to our heart. It's a smaller market, but the M50 uh -huh. is designed for boats. It's very, very much like the NSP, except it flews out of the okay because you can't can't flew through the bottom of a boat. <laughs> and, no, you can't. Yeah, and the internal fixtures on it are all stainless steel. Okay. To and everything's brass or copper over stainless. Uh, because in this salt water environment, there's going to be corrosion. Mm -hmm. But functionally, performance-wise, specification-wise, all three units are identical. You'll get the same amount of water, the same temperature control. Okay. Just a little di different configuration. Now, at some point, and correct me if I'm wrong, there are some added le letters, which is EC. I don't think that my 550 NSP is an EC. So what does that stand for? Uh, electronic control. Okay. Yeah. The original NSP did not have um, electronic control. Okay, I think my I think I have one of the originals. It's got the spring. Oh yeah, that's yeah. You've yeah. Out that a while. Yeah. 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 It, the, all the new ones are electronic control. Okay. Yeah. We we took our basic early unit from many years ago, our five five hundred and. Reincorporated a lot of the features into the 550 and uh -huh. and improved it. Got it. It's all those letters that uh, um, just <laughs> kind of differentiate. Yeah, yeah. And now there's another model. Well, there's another two models. There's the Twin Temp Two and the Twin Temp Junior. Can you talk about you know what what those are? Why why you developed them and and kind of what they do? Yes. Uh, the twin temp, both the twin temps mm -hmm. are a combination endless hot water, mm -hmm. just like the 550s, 
but they also provide space heating. So they replace the water heater and the furnace, and they do it hydronically, meaning uh-huh. you're running hot antifreeze around your home, and you can use either the small blowers that go into kick plates or bed bases or so on. They use little mm-hmm. computer fans, extremely quiet, mm-hmm. or you can have indoor heating, just using PEX pipe under the floor. We've had customers do it both ways. And hydronic heating is probably the, the most efficient, the most comfortable, especially when you're using mm-hmm. it in a radiant mode because you don't have the air stratifying hot air at the top, you know, cold yeah. at the bottom, and you don't have blowers stirring up the air. The other advantage is in a typical gas fired furnace, you're using mm-hmm. a minimum of a four inch duct. And again, when you're looking at some of those ducts have to run through cabinetry, under beds, crawl spaces, they're taking up space. Yeah. With the twin tip, you're circulating antifreeze in half inch pipes. So the conduit, getting it from one place to another is much smaller, takes up less space, and just a fraction of the heat loss along the way. Mm. And you don't have the sound of loud fans. Whisper quiet when it comes on in the middle of the night. And you only have the one unit taking up the space of installation. And at both the Twin Temp Junior and the Twin Temp 2, I'll explain the difference in a minute. Uh-huh. They mount and flew just like the NSP. No sidewall penetration, flew out through a two-inch exhaust pipe. Yep. Now the Junior, which I would say would be most preferred by the tiny home people, it's a single zone system. Okay. It means it's got one loop that runs off a of one wall thermostat. And it's also got a backup 110 volt heating element. Ah. So that it prioritizes, uh, the computer prioritizes. If you're just going to do a few dishes or wash your hands or whatever, it's just going to use your electric heating element, which you don't have to have on. But a lot of places, mm-hmm. you know, it's got minimum charge or no charge for electric. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and if you go over the capacity of the unit, it kicks the gas on. So you got both options. Ah. Now on the twin, uh, that's the twin temp junior. On the twin temp two, mm-hmm. it's exactly the same gas burner, same. T- uh, it's got a little three gallon tank in, mm-hmm. but it's got two independent zones, so that you can have a zone heating, which in a tiny home really isn't necessary. You know, it's it's not going to be big enough that you'd want to have this room, that temp, one temperature, mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. another room, another temperature. So the junior would probably work just as well for a tiny home. Twin temp two also has two electric heat elements instead of one. Okay. So there's two minor differences, and the but I think for the difference in money, people would prefer the twin temp junior. We like to make money. And sell expensive equipment, but we want it to be practical for people. So, in the in the right tiny home industry, the junior is probably the one. Yeah, that that seems like it's probably the right size for for a tiny home. Can you just I, you already mentioned it, but just in case somebody's listening and heard you, you know, use the term hydronic heating, um, can you explain what that is? Yeah, hydronic is basically using a liquid. Okay. In this case, it would it's a non toxic antifreeze. Called propylene, uh-huh. and it is in a small three-gallon tank that's heated by the burner, and it's what's circulated throughout the tiny house through PEX. Okay, just a typical PEX pipe, and uh, it's radiant heating mm-hmm. as opposed to convection heating with air. Yep, much more efficient and quieter and more even heat. So it does have a lot of advantages, but hydronic just means basically liquid. Okay. And water or liquid holds so much more, so many more BTUs than air. You can move a lot, a lot more heat through a small conduit like the half inch mm-hmm. ice pipe than you can through a, a four inch air duct. Ah. So those are the advantages. Plus, you're replacing two pieces of equipment with one. Got it. You're, yeah, you're replacing a furnace and a, 
hot water heater with with one unit. That's correct. And so the the twin temp actually has, you know, because I I mean, obviously the antifreeze is kept separate from the water. Correct. Um, so it, it all but it all flows through the same heating element or there it all flows through the, the same temperature control burner and heat exchange. Okay. Uh, what happens, it takes the antifreeze out of the, the little tank, puts it yeah. the heat exchanger above the burner, circulates it back into the tank. Mm-hmm. Now for your potable water that you use for everyday use, your showers, the kitchen and so on. Mm-hmm. There's a separate heat exchanger within this tank, submerged in the tank, which is heated with antifreeze. Okay. And then you've got to control to control the outlet temperature on that. So the water is totally separated from the antifreeze. Good. So that uh, you don't have antifreeze integrating it with water. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that wouldn't that would not be good. No, it would. It, it's it's a non toxic antifreeze, but it wouldn't taste very good. No, no. Um, so one, you know, one challenge for tiny homes kind of across the board is winter and cold temperatures. And I'm curious, um, you know, I've, I've definitely, I'm not going to like name any brands or things, but I've definitely seen plenty of, of folks, especially, you know, more in the South and not cold places who buy a, like a, a very inexpensive propane instant hot water heater that's mounted outside of their tiny house and you know they get an unexpected cold snap and you know the thing freezes up and it's just kind of kaput um can you talk about how the precision temp units handle cold temperatures and and kind of how they're able to continue operating in cold temperatures yeah we we handle it in, in two ways mm-hmm. one thing you're talking about the freezes up worst thing can happen yeah. to any uh, water heaters it freezes because either the tank yeah. the heat exchanger bursts, ice is unyielding. Yeah. Like I said earlier, we've tested ours down to twenty below zero Fahrenheit and we've had mm-hmm. customers say they went lower than that, but you know, we can't verify that. Mm-hmm. But how we, we do it in two different ways. One, we have a scenario built in into the software that if it sees thirty eight degrees in the heat exchanger mm-hmm. copper heat exchanger. It will turn the uh, gas burner on very low burn. That protects the main heat exchanger. The peripheral plumbing, the cold water line coming in Mm -hmm. into the uh, heater itself and the hot water line going out. And in uh, the case of the flow meter, which detects the flow, Mm -hmm. we've got separate little 12-volt heating elements on them Ah. that trigger at 38 degrees. So that protects Mm -hmm. the peripheral and even at that, the total 12-volt power consumption is under 3 amps when the, mm-hmm. when the cold weather freeze protection comes on. So it just right. sips electric and, and uh, propane. So we, yep. can, we have the optional 110 to 12-volt power supply to mm-hmm. power our units, and that's plenty to take care of. Normal use and cold weather operation. Yep. Now, um, one question that I always like to ask when, you know, kind of looking at different appliances for a tiny house is like, is what maintenance is required, um, you know, ongoing? Because, you know, I think people envision living in their tiny houses for, you know, for many years and they want appliances that are going to last for many years. Well, very little maintenance. The big thing is maybe once a year. Mm-hmm. Look into it. Mud daubers love to get into small spaces, mm. and uh, and there's a pressure switch in, which is a safety device which senses whether the power vent's running or not. If the power vent okay. isn't running or the air is blocked, it won't allow the burner to come on. One little mud dauber okay. in that sensor will keep it from functioning. Okay, and just keep the bugs out and so on. Make sure. But none of the water lines are kicked. Mm-hmm. Check the uh, hookups for leaks. But basically, it's pretty, pretty maintenance free. Now you want to make sure that if you're away from your tiny home or laying it up for the winter, yeah, you either keep the twelve volt power and propane on, or you do have to drain your plumbing system and the water heater. Mm-hmm. And to do that, mm-hmm. it's very easy to to drain our water heaters. 
you take the front cover off, open the pressure relief valve, open your highest tap, cold water tap, hot water tap, and it will drain out and out of the evacuate the heat exchanger. The other way, if you're winterizing your whole plumbing system, which you would have mm -hmm. to do if, if it's not going to be used all winter, you blow it out with air. Yeah. And or use the pink RV antifreeze. And yep. when pink is coming out of your taps, you know your water heater is fully winterized. Yeah. As far as starting it up in the spring, the big deal is make sure it gets the cobwebs out and any signs of mud daubers. Okay. And if you haven't, which brings it to another thing. When people are starting up not only our units, but their other equipment in the spring, there's going to be questions. Uh huh. If customer has any questions, all we encourage them to call us. Yeah. Being an American made, we're right here in Cincinnati and we have on site service, phone service on an 800 line. And we'd rather have somebody ask a question, even if they feel like it's a stupid question, and not have a problem later. Because generally, problems are due to, like we're talking about, dirt, something like yeah. that, maybe low voltage. A low, uh, bad pressure regulator on the propane tank or something, mm -hmm. or water flow problems. Yep. Which brings up another thing. With a, a lot of tiny homes, our do-it-yourselfers, like uh -huh. you and I have been in uh, past years, and putting in their own plumbing system, it might be less than ideal as far as flow rates and consistency and so on go. Maintaining flow is important. And the type of shower head that uh, people mm -hmm. have, type of faucets. Some faucets and shower heads have severe restrictors in them, which will not allow the water to run at an adequate rate. So if it's running at under four tenths of a gallon a minute, the water heater won't come on. Simple things like that. Okay. Another thing is, people might call and say, I'm getting perfect hot water from my lavatory faucet, perfect hot water from my kitchen faucet, but in my shower, it, it's not working right. We found that a lot of people will shut their shower off with a button on the shower head and put mm. their valves open. And that would be what would be called a cold water bypass because the water comes from the cold water side of the valve, goes into the hot water system, and bypasses the water heater. So when they turn on another tap, it won't turn on. Ah. So it's just simple things like that. Turn off your shower using the valve and not the, the uh, button on the shower head. Right. So the service is everything and answering questions, asking questions. Is everything. And that's a lot of simple stuff like that. Uh, a lot of the uh, other manufacturers of the cheaper foreign units, they don't have that kind yep. of service. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, you know, I've experienced being able to call in and ask questions firsthand. And it's just, it's great to be able to do that. A lot of tiny housers, whether, whether we like it or not, or whether we wanted to or not kind of become more hands-on with the maintenance of our houses and solving kind of technical issues. A lot of, you know, contractors and, and, you know, service professionals sometimes don't want to come and work on tiny houses. So we're kind of often forced into becoming DIYers. And so it's really nice when, when there is a company that you can call and talk to somebody and, and kind of get help with things. So, so we appreciate that. Yeah. Well, we know we have to do that. And you know, I, I've said more than once, you can have the, what you think is the best product in the world. If you don't have service to back it up, you don't have a product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're not once to just throw parts at, at people say, try this, try that. We try to, if there is an issue, we try to analyze it and get to the root of it. Yeah. And Ray, our service manager, is excellent. I get more compliments on him. Nice. And other people that handle service. Great. We like that. Well, uh, I was just curious, um, you know, you've been so generous with your time and just answering all my questions. Are there any just like really fun or interesting applications that you've seen, you know, NSPs or twin temps or, or shower mates, you know, put into? Yeah, there, uh, there are some applications we'd never think of. Mm -hmm. One was we found out that a salvage company that salvages uh, a, a boats and ships uh -huh. in the colder oceans, they would have a problem with their divers staying down maybe 
and their wet suits maybe a maximum of 20 minutes before they get hydrothermic. Uh-huh. Uh, here they wound up getting RV 550s, mounting them on their boats, and run uh-huh. circulating uh, water down into the wetsuits. They could stay down indefinitely or until their air ran out. Uh-huh. So save them a lot of time, save them a lot of money, and a lot of discomfort, things like that. The other thing is that we were mentioning the portable hot water. A sailing buddy of mine was a captain in the Cincinnati Fire Department. Uh-huh. And he knew I was into the hot water. He knew about the marine water heater. And he said, you know, freezing fire plugs in the winter in big cities are a real problem. Mm -hmm. And if you have to spend 20 minutes trying to thaw out a fire plug, the house burns down. Mm. If you can come up with something, we'd like to see it. Well, we designed, it was a 39-pound suitcase that had the water heater in, small propane source, a rechargeable battery, and a pump. And we were able to circulate 180-degree water into the fire hydrant and thaw it out within three minutes. Nice. And then had another application with a portable shower head for decontamination showers. And the military wound up buying those for decontamination and field showers. Mm. So it, it's, it's an application I would have never thought of. It's like because I had a friend that was a, a fire captain and told me about this issue. Mm. So there are some things you can't even imagine without experiencing it yourself. You have to depend on other people's advice and, and uh, suggestions. Nice. But other things, food service, vehicles, and so on. Yes. I'm sure for a food truck or other food service vehicle, you know, having hot water is just paramount and, and having a reliable kind of unlimited hot water. Yeah, now, one thing um, I guess I should mention, very important, mm-hmm. the fact that we are fully certified to the proper ANSI and CSA standards for these applicants. Ah. And there's a lot of the off-brand units that do not have that certification. Okay. And they wouldn't be able to sell to manufacturers. They could just sell in the aftermarket. But still, certification means it's been checked for all the safety features on it make sure that they're functional and so on. Right. We're fully certified. Yeah. And for, you know, for a on-demand propane hot water heater, that's essentially, you know, 5,500 BTUs is a lot, is a lot of flame. That's a lot of, that's a lot of fire. (laughs) You know, you don't want, you don't want that inside of your house. You know, if, unless you know, it's, it's been done correctly. 55,000 is a lot, a lot of flame. Yeah. It's not as much as some to put it in perspective. Uh, my wife and I have been heating our house for 20 years on 55,000 mm-hmm. uh, BTUs. And mm-hmm. before that, we had a 130,000 BTU furnace. So I'm using the same burner and uh, mm-hmm. heat exchanger assembly as we use in the 550. But we are able to tune it wow. to heat our house. Wow. When we started developing the um, mm-hmm. RV uh, tiny home heaters, I wanted a, a beta test. So. I used one not only to heat our water at home, and we had a 2,400-square-foot house, but I used it to replace the furnace, pumping it through a water-to-air heat exchanger. Uh, so just ran a blower through it. I replaced a 130,000 BTU furnace and uh, had a water heater with that. And uh, my wife kept saying, well, are we going to get put the bigger unit because we made a larger 200,000 BTU commercial unit for restaurants? And I said, well, this one hasn't broken yet. And it still hasn't broken. And uh, it will run when it's zero degrees out in Cincinnati, which is, it happens, it's rare. It'll run 24 hours a day, but it keeps the house warm. And that shows how much 55,000 BTUs can do if it's properly managed. Fantastic. But you're right, 55,000 BTUs in a space that you don't have uh, proper ventilation and so on, or have it designed properly, can be very undesirable. And that's why certification uh-huh. is, is key. Nice. Yeah. Well, Jerry, this has been, it's been great to, to get to finally meet you and to, to talk all things precision temp. Uh, is there, is there anything that, you know, that I haven't asked you about that you were, that you're hoping to tell our audience about? You've been quite thorough, Ethan. I appreciate that. Yeah. And, 
I, I appreciate you letting me well, thank you. Uh, visit your community. And, and if anybody has any questions, they can call me directly. Excellent. Our website is uh, precisiontemp.com. It's got our 800 number on there. They mm-hmm. can call service, sales, or me. And uh, any any questions or concerns, be glad to take care of them. Uh, because that's the, the other thing. Building a tiny home. Mm-hmm. We encourage people to go online, get our installation manual. Yep. Look at it before they lay out. This is something I should have mentioned early on. Before they start laying out mm-hmm. their floor plan. So they have a proper place for the water heater. And although it's designed yep. for zero, yep. zero clearance for heat, we do want the main access door on it accessible that you don't have to take out other appliances or take out you know, cabinet walls or anything. Make sure it's totally accessible and it's a place where you can, if you're using the NSP, go out through the floor uh, for your mm-hmm. combustion air and your flu so that don't have to rip it late, rip it out later and uh, try to mount it just like any other water heater, mount it as close to your end use points like your kitchen sink or bathroom to minimize the amount of water you use to get the, the, the water from the water heater to the outlet. And that would be like in any house using any water heater, but just pre-planning. And I think yeah. when I was looking at your website, how you were talking about design and plan mm-hmm. take a lot of time and sometimes more than actually doing the job mm-hmm. and and it's very important to avoid extra work or yeah or hassle later by planning ahead as to where you're going to install it follow the instructions and if any questions call us absolutely awesome well jerry walter thank you so much for being a guest on the show today well thank you ethan i appreciate it take care Thank you so much to Jerry Walter for being a guest on the show today, and thank you so much to Precision Temp for sponsoring this episode. If you head over to precisiontemp.com and use the coupon code THLP at checkout, you'll get $100 off any unit plus free shipping. You can find that link plus the show notes, which include a complete transcript of this episode, photos, and more at thetinyhouse.net slash 280. Again, that's thetinyhouse.net slash 280. Well, that's all for this week. I'm your host, Ethan Waldman, and I'll be back next week with another episode of the Tiny House Lifestyle Podcast.